can start. It is such a gift to be here with each of you. Thank you so much, Tama, and welcome everyone. It's so nice to see you during this blessed season among blessed seasons. I'm Dr. Sampur Farzaneh, Assistant Professor of Islamic and Digital Media Studies and Director of the Center for Multi-Religious Studies here at Star King School for the Ministry. I'd like to welcome you to this beautiful event in the heart of devotion a multi-religious Passover and Ramadan ritual and teaching, which represents a collaboration between the center and the Saran Hajar series, sacred practices and possibilities at the intersections of Judaism and Islam. We founded the center in 2021 to further the study of multi-religious identities, practices, ritual arts and education, and honor the legacy of our beloved former provost, Dr. Ibrahim Farujaje and his ministry in organic multi-religiosity. The center offers courses in a diverse array of re religious and spiritual traditions, a certificate in multi-religious studies, sponsored sessions within the Stark King Annual Symposium and other public programs, and multi-religious chaplaincy training in coordination with Stark King's chaplaincy concentration. Today's event celebrates our commitment to bring together diverse voices from multiple faith traditions gathering in shared prayer, ritual, and learning. I'm so excited and grateful to our honored speakers for leading us today, and especially our faculty member, Taya Masher, who is the Assistant Professor of the Practice of Organic Multireligious Ritual here at Star King and has done incredible work to put together this blessed event. I must also thank Xander Huffman and Zaire Bigdell for their work behind the scenes in getting this event off the ground. And our school's leadership including our president, the Reverend Rosemary Bray McNabb, 
and our Dean of Faculty, the Reverend Dr. Gabriella Latini, for their continued support of the vision of the Center for Multireligious Studies. Please join me in welcoming our honored speakers, and let's have a great event sharing, learning, and being together. Thank you so much, Dr. Sam. It is just such a joy to be here with each of you. And as we enter in to our event, I would love to offer an invocation from our beloved former provost, Dr. Ibrahim Baba Farajaje, who Dr. Sam mentioned, and um, that shapes part of our intention for the series. Here, you'll hear Ibrahim Baba speaking on Sarah and Hajar. We can't study that core of religions that I call the Hagar and Sarah religions, as opposed to the Abrahamic traditions, because there's something exciting about dealing with religious traditions that descend from a brown, single parent, homeless mother wandering around in the desert, Hagar. You can't study those traditions separately. Well, maybe the maybe those, you know, Hagar, Sarah religions are actually really connected to earth-based religious traditions. Maybe there's not this incredible wall of difference. And not falling to the other side saying like, oh, we're, you know, we're all the same, we don't have to talk about any difference, but looking into the heart of the differences to see also where artificial walls have been constructed. Because if you're you know, wandering around the desert, circumambulating a building in the desert and water is very central, there's something very earth-based about that, no matter what you want to call it. Or if you're climbing up on a mountain at 4.15 in the morning to receive the gift of the sacred text from the Holy One and blowing a ram's horn and bringing a fire, that's kind of, you know, where I come from, that's also very earth-based too. In the spirit of honoring the many places of connection in our traditions, in the spirit of honoring our ancestors, we gather this day, which for depending on where in the world folks are, uh, we are arriving at the completion of Passover today or tomorrow. Um, and it's a custom to be in ancestor honoring, to be in Yisker prayer, to be in remembering of our beloved ancestors at this time. And so I light this Yartzeit candle in honor of the ancestors who hold, guide, bless, support and inspire us on our paths, knowing that we have ancestors, loving and wise, inspiring and supportive ancestors of all kinds of blood and bone or family, ancestors of spiritual lineage or tradition, ancestors of vocation, ancestors of inspiration. And I got so excited that my flame blew out as I was talking, so let's light it up one more time. I'm inviting you as you tune in with us here to just have a moment of presencing in your heart to the ancestors who most support and love and inspire you, the ones for whom you would not be who you, the ones without whom you would not be who you are or where you are, the ones whose blessing you lean back into each day, the, one who, the ones who during the sacred holiday times and during times of threshold or transition, you most lean into presence with, honoring their memories, honoring their legacies, and honoring too the inspiration and guidance that they bring to us from the beyond. May we feel them with us in all the ways that we most need, and even in ways we didn't know possible. May it be so. It's my great delight to welcome here, to be in our ritual and teaching, our conversation, on at the intersections of Judaism and Islam, and particularly in this sacred portal that is the overlap of Ramadan and Passover, which is happening for a second year in a row, but doesn't happen for a very long time after that. Um, it's a gift to be gathering with two of my dearest collaborators to be in prayer and in learning together. And I'll share a bit about each of them before inviting them to share with you. Sheikh Hassan Manasra is International Director of the Abrahamic Reunion Project and a globally recognized interreligious dialogue facilitator, Fulbright scholar, and lecturer from Nazareth. 
Sheikh Hassan serves and has served on the boards of numerous international peacemaking organizations, including the Middle East Civic Forum, the Solha Peace Project, Anwarah Salam Lights of Peace Center, Lights of Peace Center, and the World Congress of Imams and Rabbis for Peace. He holds regular peace vigils with the Abrahamic Reunion Project and offers weekly zikr through Rising Tide International. Sheikh Hassan belongs to a Sufi family from Jerusalem and is head of the Tarikat as Salam Kadiri Sufi order. And it is such a blessing to have him here with us today. I, it's Thank my you. delight. Oh, sorry. Thank you. It is my delight also to welcome Hadar Cohen, who is an Arab Jewish scholar, mystic, and artist. Hadar teaches direct experience of God and Jewish mysticism at her spiritual skill building school, Malchut. She's a 10th generation Jerusalemite with lineage roots also in Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Hadar weaves the spiritual with the political through performance art, writing, music, and ritual. She was the first fellow at Abrahamic House, a multi-faith social change incubator, and was recently featured on season three of Rami, One Cup of Tea on Hulu, and has her own column at The New Arab. It is such a delight, Hadar, to have you here with us as well. Thank you so much for having me. So honored to be here. I'll invite Sheikh Hassan, you to open us with prayer and teaching at this sacred time. First of all, thank you to have us uh, both uh, here, Hadar and I, uh, with you. And uh, it's really our honor to be uh, this night uh, in, in through the uh, rays of the old light coming from your hearts to our heart and from our heart to your hearts to yours. Um, I'll begin with the uh, uh, traditional prayer about peace. We say, God, you are the peace. From you will come the peace. To you will go back the peace. God bless us in our life with peace. And please surround all of the world, all around us with peace, connection, harmony, understanding, knowing, and connecting. Amen. Amen. Uh, really it's uh, sometimes so hard to say something when you are next to Tia or to Hadar or to others because you will know they will they will say more and they are they have lots of uh, great things to share with us but it's because this is the time of the uh, uh, holidays um, you know two hours ago I just finished a very long prayer with many people from the Holy Land from Israel here uh, you know uh, Jews uh, Christians Muslims and Jews because we have the uh, uh, Passover we have Ramadan we have Pascha we have uh, the visiting of uh, uh, Prophet Jethro uh, in the 25th of April all of this month is the month of uh, uh, holidays and I think it's not accidentally can uh, we can have all of these uh, uh, holidays together i think it's great combination between all of the different uh, 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 from the external side the different holidays and from inner side i think all of us we can light our uh, uh, hearts with the a old niche of all of these religions because i think all of the religions came from the same niche and each one influenced another i think uh, because i'm in ramadan here also with passover but especially we say a, a long month of ramadan and beautiful month of ramadan the holy month of ramadan before we will begin ramadan the people think that the meaning of the word ramadan is to stop but it's not stopping only from eating and drinking stop from many other things in our process as a human being here our kind of 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 creating the deed of this universe need to have or to find the path the way for our direction i think we need to see the direction the direction it's not external thing it's inner thing as 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 i repeat it usually i say el ghazali say uh, to his uh, el ghazali he is a great scholar from the 12th century he passed away one 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 he say to his uh, disciples and his companions his students he said to them 
listen, stop to make your external journey. This is the time of inner journey because every phenomena you can find within you. You are the macro, you are not the micro. The micro, all, all of the things that you think about, but you are the macro. Then you need to find the direction. And the direction is before we will uh, enter to the month of Ramadan. You know, we are at the last 10 days of Ramadan now, and we try to find the supreme night for to uh, pray for God to send us peace and harmony for the tent of Abraham, of all of us. You know, but in the beginning, you know, I say to all my children, I say to them, listen, come with me. We need to find the gate of Ramadan. Where is Ramadan? Ramadan, it's not the month. Ramadan, it's the essence of that month. We need to get there and to knock the door. If no one will open the door, we will have all of us, our strength, the clean strength, the love, the harmony to open that door. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think that we opened the door and we entered there. When we entered there, we thought we will be only Muslims there. But I found many other people there. I found Tia there. I found Hadar there. I found uh, Charlie there. I found uh, uh, Jesus, Moses. I found Muhammad there. All of these prophets, they are waiting for us there because each one brought with, with him, with her, a torch of old light to say to me, Hassan, all of us, we are one. And then we need to bridge the gap between all of us. And the gap, it's not the wars or the clash that we have today, unfortunately. It's the misunderstanding between us. Because if we will understand one another, we can bridge the things. Etia, just let me know when, when to stop and when to continue. I, I don't know. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Plenty of time. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, you know, because I need to give to Hadar her time also and so on. Uh, you know, I, I, I will say a, a, a small story. Uh, uh, once I uh, went to uh, 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 stop the fast, I was about 16, 16 years old. You know, I, I heard about many things many stories happen in the history. I say, if the stories happened in the history, I think I will find, I'll meet one story in my path, in my way. And I got out of the house to go to the mosque to break the fast with the, the people. They are praying early morning there. On my way, I didn't see, I didn't meet this, the story, but I created, I imagine I created a very great story that I try to light my torch to see the, the, the path and the way. I tried and I tried, I didn't, I couldn't. I didn't succeed to do that, but suddenly something all around with me began to be light. And he say that thing she say or he say to me, oh, Rasan, we will walk with you until you will arrive to your destination, to your uh, goal. Your goal is the mosque, right? I say yes. And they say to me, it's not a mosque. This is the house of God. Would you like to arrive there? I say, yes. They say, you cannot walk. You need to ride the wave of our light. When you ride the wave of our light, then this light will flow with you until you will arrive the gate of the house of God. Don't stop there or wait to anyone to say, welcome. Open the door and enter. And I arrived there. I made this, you know, as 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 a, a, a player, and I arrived. I opened the door of the mosque. I entered, and suddenly I didn't see anyone there. I said, I see their lights there. All of the lights came to me, entered to my inner side, and exactly I combined with them and all of us we began to dance inside the mosque at that time yeah. 
such a gift, Sheikh Hassan. Thank you for this story and for what you've shared, kind of laying our understanding of Ramadan as a time not only of stopping, but of attuning our heart toward the sacred and toward, in this particular phase of Ramadan, welcoming, looking for the night of power, Laylatul Qadr, the moment that is most strong that we don't know exactly when it appears. Uh, one question before we turn to Hadar, can you speak to this, to, can you speak to Laylatul Qadr, the night of power, and the what it means that there's this very significant time, but it's a mystery when exactly it happens. So how does this keep us always paying attention for the sacred or what, what, what can you share about this? Yes, the Laylatul Qadr, it's, it's, you know, there is a, 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 por, a portion in the Quran, Surah, in the Quran called Layl uh, al-Qadr, Surah al-Qadr. It's say that uh, this night, God revealed the Quran. He's uh, exactly, God sent the Quran, the words of God, to the sky of the world, because it was in the high sky. He sent it to the sky of the world, and from there, our Prophet Muhammad get it slowly, slowly. And this uh, night, uh, uh, the Muslims uh, in the doctrine and so they think that uh, if you will ask God at uh, this night, He will answer you exactly, and it will be peaceful night along the night. It will be peaceful. Why? Because we know that you need to take care for your heart to polish the mirror of your heart, but at that night it will be auto polishing. The heart will be polishing by themselves, and then for to give you a long year with a, a very clear a, a mirror. And and this night you need to take care for yourself. But in the internal. Uh, 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 interpretation or commentary of this uh, 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 light night, we can see that our souls and spirit created at this night. And then we, we say, open yourself, be naked, naked, naked from everything under the divine, under the light of God, then you can connect to your origin. If you will connect to your origin, you will charge yourself with the real knowledge. You will know everything and then you will connect, you will love and you will be, all of the world will be one in Sani Kamel, the perfect human. This is so beautiful. I love what you're naming about the auto polishing of the heart that so often we are working hard to polish our hearts to become in attunement and connection. And with this night, the night of power, the polishing happens in a way that's almost effortless. It happens for us and sets our year. And if I'm understanding correctly, it could be tonight, it could be tomorrow, it could be the next night. We don't know. There's a mystery of when this night is. It could be any of these nights from here on forward, yes? You know, I, I want to say one thing, as you say, we don't know because it's not the double night. For example, 21, 23rd, 25th, 27th, 29th. And they ask the people, how can I know? And, and the people and and and, and the, the scholars say, you need to awake all of the last 10 nights, then you can catch the night. Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, he said, you, would you like to catch Laylatul Qadr? And they say, yes, he say, wake up all of the year. <laughs> it's not easy, I know. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sheikh Hassan, for what you're sharing here. Sure. And it's my delight to welcome Hadar Cohen to offer teachings on Passover and what is most resonant for you in this moment, Hadar. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much, Tayan. Thank you so much, Sheikh Hassan. It was so beautiful to hear you speak. It was so moved especially around the speaking of the internal realm and the path of the heart. Um, I just find so much resonance um, in Jewish tradition as well. And, you know, I am just coming back from a celebration in the desert. We celebrated Passover in the desert for five days. We went camping um, in beautiful Death Valley in California. And I'm realizing I'm just feeling so tender um, because there's something so beautiful about this 
space of the desert. In Hebrew, the word for desert, desert is midbar, which you can break up to two words, min, davar, from the word. So from the word of God. Um, and in the desert, you know, there's so many prophets of so many different traditions that found their spirituality and they found the path to God through the, um, through the desert. And I think that part of what happens to us in the desert is that we allow the distractions that we have to cleanse away, right? All of a sudden, everything, all the baggage that we are carrying, like the expansiveness of the desert just cleanses, cleanses us away and it allows us to listen a little bit more deeply. And I think about that because, you know, sometimes it's, it might be hard to hear God and it might be hard to hear the word of God, but it's not because God's not speaking. It's because we're distracted, right? Whatever we are doing, we are filling our schedule with whatever it may be. And we're not carving out this time, this time to listen and to listen deeply. And I think that, you know, one of the things that is so blessed about sharing this month that is such a sacred time of so many traditions and particularly of Judaism and Islam of Passover and Ramadan. It's, it's so wonderful because our holidays are not just like one day and then that's it, right? They're usually um, over a period of time because it's not just like, okay, go to dinner and then have a good time. And then you found God, but it's actually about going through a process and it's a process of transformation. So there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end, right? And I think that having, you know, holidays that span at least a few days and up to a month, there's something so profound there because we can relax into that process. So maybe today wasn't, you know, so good, but then the next day I show up again and then all of a sudden maybe a spiritual. So there's something about that consistency of, of showing up day after day and allowing for it to be a process um, that, that is just so beautiful to me. And I want to share a little bit about this holiday of Passover, which we are coming at the end of, which is, um, you could say, one of the biggest holidays in Judaism. And actually, the Hebrew calendar year actually starts with this month because it starts with this holiday of liberation, right? Our, our calendar year starts with this holiday of liberation. And sometimes people get confused because they're like, well, Rosh Hashanah, right? That's the beginning of the year. But in Judaism, we have multiple New Year's, um, and part of that is because we both follow the cycles of the sun and the cycles of the moon. So Rosh Hashanah, we say, is head of the year. It's head of the cycle of the sun. But Nisan, which is the Hebrew month of Passover, we say is Rosh Chodeshim. It's the head of the moons, right? It's when the cycle of the moons start. And that is very similar to the astrological calendar, right? That we start with the airy season, we start with the spring, we start with renewal. Um, so, we, and we start with this, this newness of the, of the moon energy. So, you know, in some ways, this month is also the celebration of the moonly cycle, um, which is something that, you know, both Judaism and Islam uh, revere so much is, is the cycles of the moon, because the moon really represents our internal world, right? It points us to our internal dimensions, right? And it's so easy. It's like, you know, we have these eyes and we keep looking outside. <laughs> so easy to just continuously look outside and get our information from there. But if we were to do that, we would be really misled because the truth is not out there. It's actually in here. So this is why sometimes, you know, the mystics, they share that we need to sometimes close our eyes, you know, and that's why the nighttime is so powerful as a play, as time of prayer and practice. It's like when the moon is shining and when the sun is, you know, not around, because the sun, it can be so intense. It's just showing the light so strongly, but sometimes that's misleading, right? So we need the sun to go down and we need the moon to come up and we need to close our physical eyes so that we can open our spiritual eyes. And with our spiritual eyes, we actually see things that perhaps we did not expect because we we didn't know. It's it's like, you know, like you were sharing, Sheikh Hassan, about the mystery, right? There's there's a mysterious nature there. Um, and that's something I've been thinking quite a, a lot recently in the last few months about the difference between the religious mystics and the religious fundamentalists. Because if you look at every religious tradition and every tradition, you have both, right? You have 
the fundamental strand and you have the mystical strand. And I've been thinking about what is the difference between the people and how they view God. And what I've come to understand is the fundamentalist, they are really certain that they know who God is. They read something that is written in their holy text, whatever that holy text may be, and they say, listen, this is what it says, and God promised this, and God said this, so now we're going to force it to be true in this world. We're so certain, and we're so clear about what God said, and we know what it means, and it needs to look this way. So there's this element of force and control because it comes from the certainty of knowing who God is. But the mystics, they have such a different relationship to God because um, they know that we don't know God, actually. And actually not knowing God is the heart of that faith. Because, of course, we know the scriptures and, of course, we know the, you know, the, the, the word of God. But we know that we also don't know. And there is something so deep about allowing ourselves not to know. Because as we see, you know, we, we see this in scripture so often, especially in the Torah, you know, sometimes God changes God's mind. God says this in one way, and then God says another thing in a different time. And, then we're, and you know, and, and also in the Torah, we know that it's not meant to be taken literally. And we see that specifically with the Passover story. It's not about a literal story, but it's about a metaphor. You can think about it also through the realm of mythology that guides us to understanding truth. So the mystics know that there are many levels of interpretation, and that is why it's not so helpful to be so certain, because when we're so certain, and that kind of relates to just seeing life with the physical eye, right? When we're so certain, it's like, oh, I, I know what I see, I see, and I have a hand, and it has five fingers, but maybe I have another hand that I just can't see, and it's just in the energetic realm, and if I would close my physical eye and open my spiritual eye, all of a sudden, I would see something so different. So the mystics are always on this journey of learning who God is because we know that God is infinite and that whatever we may know, there's always more to know. So it is better to be in surrender to that mystery and allow God to emerge moment by moment than to be so certain and say, well, this is what God told me. And now I'm going to control my reality to make sure that it looks this way. And that is something that, you know, going back to this teaching about organic multi-religiosity, I, I find that so, so powerful because I believe that, especially the times that we're living in, you know, there's so much heartache and so many different forms, so many people suffering. And I believe that it's an invitation for the mystics of all different traditions to come together and to share this, this path to the heart. Because really, it's where the heart, the heart lies, is where we get liberated, right? When we, when we understand that the physical reality is not all there is, but actually there's a deeper reality. And when we surrender to that which we do not know, and we allow for the heart to lead, and we celebrate, right, the different traditions and the different mystical path that there are there's no reason to be threatened it's just because i sing in this way and you sing in that way it doesn't mean we're not singing to the same god so there's no reason to be threatened right it's actually more an invitation for a celebration so i'll just share with that a little bit about um well okay about passover i'm like there's so many teachings all the time because passover it's so deep you know it's really really so deep it's it's the biggest holiday and and I, and one of the teachings that i just love is going back to it being in the hebrew month of nisan nisan it comes from the hebrew ness which means miracle and the passover story is all about miracles right it's all about celebrating the miracles that god did to the ancient israelites from guiding from being slaves to pharaoh and egypt to being a liberated people um, through being crossing the red sea and you know getting the torah so there's something about this time of miracles that is so profound and that's also something i've been thinking about because Sometimes we think that the time of miracles has passed, you know, maybe God did miracles like thousands of years ago, but nowadays it's like, we don't have miracles anymore because how can, you know, gravity all of a sudden shift in a different direction. But miracles I would like to offer that they're not actually speaking about a change in a supernatural law, 
But actually what they're speaking to is about a change in perception. Because so often we, you know, with our conscious minds, we, we think we know reality because we're so certain, again, we're so certain that we're seeing things clearly, you know, like, I'm like, this is gold. And I know that this color is gold, right? So I, I am so certain about it. And when a miracle happens, it actually shatters my narrative of what I thought was true. And it opens my heart into another dimension. Or sometimes I like to say that it makes the impossible possible. And all, you know, all of us, we have all these different narratives about what is possible and what is not possible or what is true or what is not true. And when a miracle comes along, it, it, it is like this you know, spiritual expansion that really guides us into a new way of being. And, and that you could say is part of the Passover story. And one of the lines that we say, Mina Metza Karatiya, from the narrow places, I call to you, I call to God, Anani Bamechavya. And God answered me in this expansive place. And, you know, I was just in this desert and this big festival. And, and we sang this song over and over and over again. And I was so moved because I felt like I finally could maybe understand what this song was about. It's so simple. It's just one line. Like, I called to you from the narrow and you answered from the expanse. And, and I find that that is, you know, at so much at the heart of that relationship to divinity. You know, we call out to the divine when we're constricted, whether with through our mental thoughts, through our maybe illness, God forbid, or whatever comes, we have some constriction, we have some suffering, but, and, and we want help. We want, we want understanding of, you know, what is happening. So we reach out in prayer and we reach out to God, but God answers us with the expanse. God opens us into this whole new realm of possibility that we do not, we did not know was available to us because we were so tight in our, you know, in our narrow spaces. So that movement from that narrow into that expanse, that is what we're practicing every Passover. And Taya also gave me a, a heads up when I should stop speaking because I'm, I can just speak and speak and speak. You know, we can be here all night like the Passover Seder. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this movement from that narrow to that expanse is really the heart of that Passover story. And you know, in Passover, one of the core things that we do is that we tell the story of Passover. The element of storytelling is so important because stories is how we shape our consciousness, is how we shape our understanding of reality. And part of the story of Passover is a story about going from a place of oppression to a place of liberation, you know, through the prophet Moses, through the hand of God. But one of the things that I love that is present in the, in the Passover Haggadah, which is the telling of the Passover story that we do, is that there's a line that says, In every generation, a person is obligated to see themselves as if they personally left Egypt. And I, I find that so beautiful because it's like, it really takes our stories to the next level. So we're not just telling the story about something that happened to our ancestors thousands of years ago, although of course it's so beautiful to, you know, rejoice in the night and share stories of our ancestors and honor them. But we're actually talking about an experience that we are personally having. Because one of the things that we know about freedom is that no one can actually grant us freedom. Freedom is not something that someone from the outside can give us because freedom is actually about an internal process that we go through, right? So, so the Passover story, right, is, is telling the story of going from oppression to liberation, but it's not just actually talking about just an external condition of being slaves to Pharaoh, to being servants of God, right? It's not just about this change of external reality, but it's actually the change in the internal reality, right? That we're finding spiritual freedom. And that is where we find our true power. Because I believe that every single person has the power to free themselves. Because we each have that power of God within us, right? We're not dependent on anything external of us to free us. Of course, you know, may we all be blessed with material resources 
sorts with freedom from oppression of all sorts and and all of that we may, may we all be blessed by that and still even if we have all of our material needs tended to right we have housing and food and resources and whatever we may need we come home at night and then our mind starts racing right all of a sudden we have these thoughts and we don't maybe we don't like them maybe we're filled with judgment or resentment or anger or, and, and our emotional body is doing all sorts of things and, and then we have to take responsibility for what is alive in our internal world and it's not so simple because as Sheikh Hassan was saying, an internal world is the infinite, right? So we have to sit there and meditate all day and just sort through, okay, now let, what's this anger about? What's this sadness about? You know, and so, so this tending to that internal world, this is part of what the spiritual path offers us. And that is where we say that is the path to liberation. That when we start looking inside, that is when we know we're on the path. Because the, so long as we're looking outside and we're looking for someone to save us and we say that freedom is, you know, when this and this changes in the world, we are stuck in this mechanism of control and disempowerment because I believe that my power is outside of me. But actually, God gifted me the power that is inside of me and I have this capacity to transform myself through cultivating my inner world. And this is where we have all the mystical traditions of prayer, of ritual, of, of all these ways to, to uh, transform our internal reality. Um, so I really, I want to offer that to us, that our journey to freedom start with our personal internal reality. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so beautiful, and now it's like all the science fields are catching up with quantum physics and all of that, but the spiritual mystics, they knew this ages ago, right? When, when you change something from the inside, it's not that you're just changing something inside of you. You're actually changing the whole world because the energy that's inside of you is actually also impacting the energy outside of you. And, and that is why we say that you know, the power, it starts from the inside because, you know, sometimes in, in our lives, we think that we're all individual selves and that we're separate beings and I'm here and you're there. And, but actually in the God field, which I like to call it, right? God is everywhere. So, so when I'm in touch with the God in me, what I'm doing is that I'm activating the God in the world. So it's not that I'm just changing my personal self, actually. I'm, I, I'm actually shifting the consciousness of the world. But my my path to doing that is through my my personal self, right? Through my internal world. It's, there's there's no other way. There's no other way to find freedom outside of myself. It, all, it has to be through, right? It has to be through this um, narrow narrowness. And then the last thing I'll share. I know I've been talking for a while, and I'm just like all these teachings. It's just so beautiful. And um, yeah, I start, I'm starting to record all these teachings because I feel like Passover has so much to share from us. But part of the thing in the Passover story is that we have two um, main characters: Moses, our prophet, who you know guides the Israelites to freedom, and Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the one who hardens his heart and refuses to free the Israelites. And one of the things in the Kabbalistic tradition, Kabbalah is really interested in language and, you know, identifying the way that um, different Hebrew letters appear in different shapes and different forms. But one of the things that I noticed, and I'm sorry if this is going to go a little over the head, but it's just such a good teaching and hopefully you'll be with me for it. Um, this, this root appears quite a bit in the Passover story, and the root is kaved, kaf bet dalid. Kaved translates to heavy. And we see that actually specifically with Moses and Pharaoh together. So for Moses, when Mo Moses goes to the burning bush and God first reveals God's self there, one of the things that Moses says, he says that I'm kaved my tongue is heavy, my mouth is heavy. I cannot go to Pharaoh and I cannot speak because I have a lisp, right? Like my there's something about my my mouth that is heavy. And then when he goes to Pharaoh, it's, the scripture says that Pharaoh is kved live. Sorry, my video is frozen. Is it well, you can hear me? Okay, so I'll just keep going a little bit and hopefully God will be with us all. Maybe it's part of the closing the physical eye and opening the spiritual eye. <laughs> um 
So Pharaoh, it says, kved lev, right? That his heart was heavy. And it's interesting that we have this, this verb that is actually talking about these different body parts, right? Because going back to this teaching of the internal world, the, 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 the heaviness expresses itself in our body, right? When we're heavy with something, it, it manifests in the, in the world. And, sorry, in our bodies. So, so Moses is kved pe and Pharaoh is kved lev, right? Moses is, um, his mouth is heavy and Pharaoh, his heart is heavy. And one of the things that I want to offer, this is a deeper teaching, so I'll just, I guess I'll just share a glimpse of it and then we'll, we'll carry on. Um, but the reason why Moses is such a beloved prophet, and this is something that we can see actually his mother, his mother, her name is Yocheved. So again, you see the Chaved coming back again, but there's a Yod there. And in, in Kabbalah, we know whenever there's a Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, those letters that are attached, we know that there's a presence of God there. So actually, his Moses' mom, his name literally meant heavy with God, which, you know, she was heavy with Moses, the, with, the, with the prophet of God. And, and she kind of, she had in her body this wisdom of integrating God with the heaviness or with the suffering of the world or with the pain or with the thing that, you know, there's a way that, and that is actually what Moses, that is a journey of Moses. The journey of Moses was learning to go from that heaviness of this reality of the suffering of the oppression of the pain of the heaviness of our body parts, whatever they may be and moving to God. This is why when Moses finally gets to God, he says, show me, your your glory and again we see kaved but now we see it with a va which means kavod which means glory the glory of god so moses his whole journey of liberation what right like the prophet the prophet is not someone who's just like has an easy life right they usually have a very hard life because part of their task is learning how to find god through the heaviness but part of what distinguished moses from pharaoh right pharaoh succumbed to the heaviness he let his heart be heavy, right? He didn't bring the presence of God into it. And Moses, you know, the reason why he had to keep coming back to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, let my people go, is because he kept needing to learn and to train himself and how to confront this heavy energy, this heavy energy of the heart, this heavy energy and bring that presence of God. So I bless us that whatever personal journey of freedom we are embarking on, that whatever heaviness we are carrying, may we find that presence of God and may we allow for that to liberate ourselves and not just our personal selves, but also may that impact our collective reality so that we, me all, we all may feel more freedom in our world. And thank you so much for for hearing me and sorry for the freezing and I will pass it back to you, Taya. Okay. Mm, thank you. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Hadar, for these potent and beautiful teachings. In a couple of minutes, I will invite Sheikh Hassan to lead us in a bit of dhikr. And before I do, I want to share um, just some ritual with you. I see you unmuted, Sheikh Hassan. Did you want to chime in before I offer us a Passover? I'm, I'm okay now. I'm okay. Um, yes, I can hear you. I, I'm, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, we will begin with the, uh, Iddikr. Uh, I'll make it small. Uh, uh, our time is so tight, but, uh, I'll begin. Fium litnin, ahna litnin. Raihain alafin, Raihain alafin, Raihain alafin. Fium litnin, Fium litnin, Raihain alafin, Raihain alafin. Allahu. Allahu, 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 
Allahu 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 قد أتاك اعتذر لا تسلهم الخبر كلما أطلت له في الحديث أختصر في عيوني خبر في عيونه خبر في عيونه خبر في عيونه خبر ليس يكذب النظر ليس يكذب النظر قد وفى قد وفى بموعدي حين خانت البشر هو Oh, Sheikh Hassan, thank you so much. For those present who are new to the practice of dhikr, can you say a few words about what dhikr is and perhaps speak to the remembering and the forgetting? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, dhikr is really the people translate that remembrance because you are a member or a dhikr is repeating. But uh, in, 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 in my dimension, I say it's forgetness. It's not remembrance because you need to forget everything and to remember one thing. Then if you need to forget everything, say forgetness. Forget everything except or only you need to remember the light that it exists and real. And as as uh, Hadar say that the the eternity and the existence, the real existence within us. But if we need to be here, I think we need to connect to that light, the eternity light. Then we can be enlivened all the time. And uh, uh, Dicker, you know, this is the main ritual. Uh, of the Sufis that they make it every Thursday and every Monday. Monday it's called Ilahi because you need to chant all the time and uh, 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 Dikr is a Thursday. One day we will do it together. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Sheikh Hassan. And I'm I'm so moved as, as you speak to the Monday and Thursday. I'm reminded of the many connections between traditions because of course in Judaism Monday and Thursday are days that we read from Torah in addition to Shabbat and it's understood that these days are kind of amplified days of study and prayer in part because in ancient times in the ancient Near East those were market days when folks were already gathering and yet it shares uh, it points yet again to one of the many overlapping threads in our tradition and I'm remembering too as you're speaking of the 
not only the remembering, but the forgetting. I'm thinking of what Hadar was also speaking to of the ways we both know God and we don't know God. And when we're in the mystery, that can be the most elevating in some ways. I'm excited to invite folks into a little bit of Passover ritual. And then I also want to open space for any questions. Feel welcome if you have questions or things to share, feel welcome to point uh, to place them in the chat to us. We're happy to be in conversation with you. I want to invite you into a Passover ritual that is quite dear to me. You may be familiar that a custom of Passover is to be in the practice of Seder, the ritual meal. It literally means order and there are very many steps that make up the Seder, 15. And often this ritual meal of remembering, of telling the story that Hadar was alluding to in her share um, can last into the wee hours of the night. And for me, each step has its potence and for everyone, for folks who engage, each step has its potence and its meaning. And often we may have in any given year, in any given Seder, a particular element that is most alive, that is most resonant, that is most juicy. And I want to invite you on this real, the last day where Seder happens in Jewish tradition, I want to invite you into one of my very favorite Seder practices. So I have here a bowl of water and I have here a vessel of salt. I'm going to pour a bunch of salt into this water and I wanna invite you to consider the sacredness of water, the blessing that water brings. If you wish to write in the chat, I think even though we can't see you, I think you can type in the chat to all participants who are here. Consider the blessings that water brings. For me, I'm aware of flow and cleansing, healing, nourishment, immersing. And I think too of the blessings that salt brings, the minerals, the savory, the protection, the cleansing, the remembering salt as, a, as a, an elemental tool for making ritual. I'm seeing in the chat from Connie, water is life, yes. Water is life, salt is nourishment. Feel welcome, those who wish to pour in the chat anything about what water is for you, what salt is for you. And as I just brought the water and salt together, for many of us, that symbolizes tears, that symbolizes healing. There's a, a quote that I love from a writer named Isaac Dennison. Salt water is a cure for everything, sweat, tears, and the sea. And I'm seeing in the chat from Maggie, water is connection and relationship. And from Cindy, water holds memory and is intelligent. And from Habib, oh, I'm just losing the chat one moment. Hmm. The chat is disappearing for me. If anyone else can read it. Ah, there, from Habib, water for life is my Twitter. I love it. So water holds so many blessings here. And in the Seder, there's a section called Karpas, greens or earth healing, in which we dip new life, fresh greens. I have here parsley, though many different greens are used, sometimes lettuces, where we dip the new life, the, the, the messenger of spring, of new beginnings, of possibility. We dip this new life into the salt water. And I'll read here a little bit from the Haggadah, the, the Seder map that I've created called the Haggadah. In Jewish custom, salt is protection, preservation, nourishment, and healing. As we dip fresh greens, the vitality of the earth into salted waters, we call to mind the places of greatest well-being in our bodies, in our lives, and in the world. We envision those places of greatest well-being touching what is in greatest need of care and of healing. We pray for the earth and the thriving web of life. We can understand that healing happens not only by focusing on the places of fragment or distress, but healing happens by focusing on what is most well in the body, in the energy body, in the community body, and bringing that imprint of wholeness to what is broken and needs healing. And so we attune to the vibrance and the vitality 
as we pray for healing. And I'm going to offer in Hebrew, in feminized Hebrew, this prayer for this, um, for this act. And I invite you as I dip the salt water and as I say the blessing, I'll sprinkle a little salt water on each of you by Zoom. And I'll invite you to just hold in your heart what you feel most needs healing, what you're praying for healing for, perhaps in your own life or in the community or life of your beloveds, perhaps in the world. You can hold it in your heart or you can type it into the chat. Bruha at Shechina, Eloteinu Ruach Haolam, Boreitz Peri Adama. A wellspring of blessing are you who nourishes, protects, and heals. And feel this sprinkling all over of the salt water on you, this blessing of healing, of vitality, of new possibility from the well of the salted water. And I invite you now into a Passover song. It's an adaptation of a well-known Passover song called Dainu. Dainu means enough. And the way I sing it, I like to sing it as more than enough. If only we be gentle and wise. If only we see through compassionate eyes. If only we free our true voice to rise, dainu, 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 dainu. I am more than enough, you are more than enough, we are more than enough, dainu, dainu, dainu. Only we protect Earth Mother, if only we respect sibling, sister, and brother, if only we connect with each other. Die, you die, die, you die. I am more than enough. You are more than enough. We are more than enough. Dainu. If only we flow forth in love. If only we know God below and above. If only we see all that we dream of. Dainu. Dainu. I am more than enough. You are more than enough. We are more than enough. Dainu. If only we embody divine, if only we take our sweet time, if only we root as we climb. Dainu. I am more than enough, you are more than enough, we are more than enough. Dainu, 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 In such prayer that in this year to come we know and recognize the more than enoughness that we each are the more than enoughness of our beloveds our community that we even as we dream even as we seek to create transformation and liberation we root our movement for change in honoring and nourishing what is already full what is already more than enough perceiving possibility from a place of gift rather than lack and this for me is an essence of passover and it's a gift to be in this inquiry with each of you here 
I'll invite, if there are any questions or things that you'd love to hear Sheikh Hassan Hadar and I speak on, feel welcome to send that to us in the chat. And I'll invite either you, Hadar, or Sheikh Hassan to pop in with anything that's alive for you as we see if folks have particular questions here. Such a gift. Also, I'm seeing words in the chat from our beloved President Emerita Rebecca Parker. Almost happy birthday, Rebecca, and thank you so much for joining us in this gathering. It's such a great gift. Such a great gift to be with you all at this time. That is the that is the landing of Pesach, but the opening of the portal toward the night of power in Ramadan. And we have a few more minutes together here until so we'll see what wants to emerge. We'll make a little more ritual if that's what's right. And there's one more prayer that I'd love to offer in this space. It's a prayer of elements and it connects to a uh, an aspect of Passover known as the four questions. You may have heard of the four questions as a, as a moment for the very youngest person in the Seder to ask, to inquire into how is this night, how is this holiday, how is this time different from any other night, from any other time? And there's so many answers. But for me, when I listen in to what are the relevant questions, what's most exciting to me is the not the specific questions that are asked in the Seder, but the, the elevation of the process of asking questions, that asking questions is even more sacred than offering answers. And this is something that feels very true in my life, that when I let myself not know, and when I ask the right questions, or even, I might not know what the right questions are, but when I let myself be in question rather than be in knowing, so much becomes possible. So I have one more song here for you, and then I'll, and then I'll uh, open it back up to Sheikh Hassan and Hadar to see what emerges. So this four questions is an elemental four questions. Again, we were just amidst the blessing of water, and now we expand to the blessing of a number of elements here. It connects to the core blessing, the core song of Passover, but takes it in an earth-honoring direction. How is this moment unique and divine? How is this moment unique and divine? Sacred space and sacred time. Sacred space and sacred time. What is the blessing the earth roots and reveals? What is the blessing the earth roots and reveals? Embody the dream and heal. Embody the dream and heal. What is the blessing the water flows through our veins? What is the blessing the water flows through our veins? Surrender, allow the change. Surrender, allow the change. What is the blessing the air breathes through our lungs? Be and become. Be and become. What is the blessing the fire ignites and sparks? Transform, illumine the dark. Transform, illumine the dark. Mm, just weaving in the many ways that the elements of earth, of water, of air, of fire are so present in our honoring of these sacred times of Passover, and also the sustenance that is such a gift during Ramadan. And folks are, I'm imagining on this Zoom across many time zones. So I don't know if folks who are in practice are amidst the fast or amidst breaking the fast, but I'm thinking of the sacredness of dates, which are a shared blessing in our traditions and which, which are a, a sweetening of the beginning of the break fast. I'm wondering, Sheikh Hassan, if you'll speak about the blessing and power and teachings on dates in our traditions. 
Yes, it's it's you know uh, uh, it's very important to break your fast on dates, especially or water. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he say, uh, if you want to come to break the fast, break your fast on date or water. First of all, in date, if you don't have date, take the water. The date, it's. Uh, 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 it's very important, and in in the Muslim tradition, they say that the tree of dates, it's born from the last part of uh, the the soil of the human. It's the date and the human; they are from the same soil, and uh, the Prophet Muhammad say, "Break your fast on this because you will uh, uh, cover all of your inner side." The, the light of inner side with your external side, the food external side, it's very important for you. Now, the, my, my sheikh told me, uh, if you will eat the date as you completed your circle of fasting, because you will taste the external taste and the inner taste of connection and knowledge. Yeah. Yes. So beautiful. Thank you. Hadar, will you add a bit here? Sure. Just about the power of dates. <laughs> or whatever is alive for you either. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that um, I heard while being in the desert um, as we were leaving, a person shared of how sometimes when you're out in the desert and you are thirsty and you are yearning for water or for food or whatever it may be and of course in jewish tradition water is compared to torah to spiritual wisdom so when we're thirsty for water it's not just physical water we're thirsty for but actually for that spiritual life force is what we're thirsty for but one of the things that he offered was that sometimes a small taste needs to last a long time and I really love that because actually that's what I was thinking about with the date because <laughs> it's the date, you know, it's like, and, and I, and I think about that also with the, um, you know, with my friends and community who break the Ramadan fast, right. Breaking on the date, you, you actually start with something small, with something tender, with something, you know, that um, has so much nourishment, but just like in a, such a small bite. And I think that just shows also that spiritual process, right? We don't we don't go to God and we say, okay, like give us the lamb, give us you know the whole feast right away. And we see that in the Passover Seder as well. We don't start out with the whole meal, but we actually like build up to it by steps, by little tastings, right? We first share this small date or we do the karpas or whatever it may, may be. And that's how we open our appetite to be able to have you know, a fuller meals. And I think that is just similar to that spiritual process as well. We don't just open our eyes and minds and they're just like, God, take everything, right? But we actually have to first start by small steps and small, small glimpses. And then slowly with time, we become more open. I'm so moved by what you're sharing here, Hadar. And one of the things that arises for me is I don't know how many folks on this call have participated in Passover seders before in a full kind of way. But one thing that happens in Jewish community often just before the first seder is in a way there's a psycho-spiritual echoing of the constriction of the fleeing, um, the Mitzrayim, fleeing the narrow place of bondage. And just before the seder, there's like a, almost like a birth canal, like a a tightening before the liberation. And similarly, there can be during the Seder, because there's so many elements, 15 elements, there are many elements to get right. Judaism has so much beauty in it. And also many of us have internalized the pressure to get the religious rituals right. And sometimes the structure, there can be a focus to get to the structure, get all the structures right, sometimes to the loss of the heart of the ritual. And so for me, one of the things that I play with in Passover, as someone who is very familiar with the importance of each of the many, many steps, and um, is for me, part of what I find to be the freedom and the holiday and the liberation of the holiday is actually choosing to approach 
this time and letting it be practice for approaching anything in a way that um, shakes me free of the expectation and pressure of perfectionism. That actually the true liberation of Passover is not by doing every step of the ritual perfectly, but finding heart, finding presence in whatever I am doing. And so today, for example, rather than offering you 15 steps, I'm, show, I'm showing you my favorite step and saying, let's go deep here. And for me, this is like, um, how can I say it? It's a, an imprinting that I, that I like to gather from Passover into the rest of my year, that rather than ca getting caught up in the structure of the many uh, expectations to get something right, I do my best to prepare. I gather what's most important to me and I listen for what's alive in the moment and how to be most attuned to liberation. And maybe for me, that means bringing my full presence to one element and being curious about what happens when I'm in the organic flow of attention of devotion in one place and letting that one depth of attention be a river that guides me to whatever else is next. And so for me, as I approach the Passover Seder, I've, I appreciate an organic flow like that. That's a dynamic tension between structure and heart. In Judaism, there's a, a dance we speak of, keva and kavanash, form, structure, and intention or flow. And in my experience working with many folks, one of the greatest spiritual places of work, let's say, and possibility is finding each of our unique relationship between form and flow, between Keva and Kavana. What amount of structure most serves your heart in full expression? For me, if I have lots of heart and not enough structure, maybe I don't have the, the way I need to flow. If I have too much structure, it can dampen my heart space or my flow. And so part of spiritual practice for me, part of what both Passover and Ramadan and my experience invite me into is being in this balance of form, of structure, and of heart intention. Finding the dance that's the sweet spot on the dial. You know, when we have sound frequency and radio, we kind of look, I guess, I don't know if people tune radios like this anymore, <laughs> but I've had a lot of practice tuning radios like this, listening for that point where the frequency is most clear. And for me, the, the spiritual practice of this time is an invitation to tune that dial, to tune that frequency, to find the sweet spot, and also to recognize that for me, my sweet spot of form and flow might be different than yours. Maybe you need a bit more structure than me to find your essence of presence and heart and connection to however you understand source. Maybe you need a bit more spaciousness than I might need. And maybe even for myself, in some moments, I need more flexibility and in other moments, I need more rigor or discipline. And this dance of spiritual practice and path, as I understand it and experience it in both Judaism and Islam, is inv an invitation to keep honing, to keep tuning. I'm thinking of Sheikh Hassan so beautifully speaking of the polishing the mirrors of the heart and how in this time, these 10 days of Ramadan, there's Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power, which we have the blessing if we're, if may we be so blessed of the auto polishing of the heart, right? And I feel like I'm kind of looking for auto tune. Those of you who are instrumentalists might know there's a thing called auto tune where like how we get our instruments just, just in that right spot. And so as we are each kind of becoming instruments of devotion more and more clearly, I feel like this is a, a powerful invitation that we have in this time. And I'm excited to be in practice with each of you as we attune and tune together, finding our rituals, finding our learning, finding our way. Thank you for being here on this journey. And as we move toward completion of our gathering today, I'm hoping, Sheikh Hassan, that you'll guide us in another bit of zikr, if you will. Yes. Before, before we do, Hadar, is there anything you want to say in completion before we enter our zikr? Um, no, I just am so, yeah, so moved by this conversation and may we be blessed to continue this multi-religious prayer, this multi-religious weaving of bringing our traditions, um, together through our heart channels and may we serve God more, 
through more freedom, more wholeness, more devotion, and more connection. I mean, inshallah, I mean, can you hear its own? May it be so. Thank you, Hada. Really, I'm so happy to 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 be um, at, at this great event with Hadar, with UT, and with all of the uh, other. Okay. طلبت من سيد الخمار مغفرة فقال هيا فالإبريق معبو به طاطأت قبل اليوم في حلب ونمت فيها ونجم القطب عنقود ويفنى الظلام وروح الليل باق قيتون وباب خمارتي في الليل موصود هوا على قدمي الساقي وقبلها وقال لي أنت بعد اليوم موعود الله حي 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 Allah hai 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 أمان عليك أليل طويل وهاتي العمر عالأول بحب جديد وقلبي سعيد ويارتني عايشة تعال أول أمانة 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 عليك قليل طويل أوه أوه Thank you أوه I mean, thank you so much for the blessing of this prayer, Sheikh Hassan. Thank you so much to all who have woven here. Such a gift to gather. First, I just offer prayer to Creator, to all who weaves us, to the 
oneness and the uniqueness for the gift of gathering at the sacred sacred time with such great gratitude to the loving and wise ancestors and guides who bless and support us in this work with particular gratitude for the inspiration and blessing of Sheikh Dr. Ibrahim Baba Farajaje who weaves in this realm of multi-religious ritual and in the work of Star King and the Sara and Hajar series in so many ways. May this devotion of care and attention in this time together be deeply blessed and a great blessing in our lives in this sacred time and beyond. Amen, amen, inshallah, ki mithi ratzon, may it be so. And thank you again to each of you. A particular thanks to Dr. Sam Porfarzana, the director of the Center for Multi-Religious Studies at Star King School for the Ministry for believing in this project, for convening us here together, uh, for weaving this gathering. A particular invitation, if you haven't joined us yet in the Sarah and Hajar series, sarahandhajar.com, there are amazing conversations at the intersection, intersections of Judaism and Islam. We would love to play with you and to listen with you there. Also, exciting news, Star King just today announced our symposium, our multi-faith symposium, our multi-religious symposium for the end of August on both the East and West Coast and online. We have an amazing speaker and offerings lined up, so feel welcome to join us for that. And with such blessing on your Ramadan, on your Passover, and gratitude to you all, we, um, we say thank you and salam shalom. Salam Shalom. Thank you so much. So blessed to be here with you all. Salam Shalom <laughs> to all of you. <laughs>